ये बो आर यू I'm at the Compagnie Theatres. Um, I don't know if you've ever been here. The big theater, because you, you didn't see Shu, or did you? No, but this looks amazing. Are you, is that a, a green screen thing behind you? Yeah, it's, oh. a, it's a wide screen thing, you know, for projection and stuff. We're actually in the big space of the theater. Right, but that, that's the actual theater, not a background behind, right? Right, so, but this, the audience seating is on that side of the theater. It's a huge space, it's really uh, gorgeous. And it's kind of a special place for me because obviously um, Shuher premiered here. Mm -hmm. This is kind of where the success of that play started. So it's just really great. The theater and I have a great relationship and we collaborate on a bunch of stuff. So it's really cool. Mm -hmm. That's super dope. So the theater asked me to do this and it's this project that they're calling um, City Icons. They asked me to think or select uh, different people that I wanted to have this conversation with and a bunch of people popped into my head and obviously you as well. And then when we're done, I'm having a conversation with Jonathan. It's his birthday today. Oh. Did you ever meet Jonathan? He runs oh. the National Black Theater in Harlem. So can you talk a little bit about the stuff you're, you, you are working on? <laughs> Currently, I am working on um, deconstructing one of my mixtape series, which is called the Afro Digital Migration. Um, oh, cool. house music, yeah, house music and post apartheid South Africa. So I started the series in 2013 and I've done um, three different mixtapes, um, looking at three different styles of South African house, and also uh, talking about the process um, as a part of deconstructing work, um, talking about my relationship to South African political history and how that informed my, my, my ear and, and the way that I kind of string this music together. Um, another thing that I'm working on is thinking about the relationship and, and writing about the relationship between um, black people and yoga and jazz, because there's this long history of people like um, Rosa Parks and Alice Coltrane, um, and the way that they use, you know, different sort of um, um, Hindu practices, breathing practices to inform the way they approach music, you know, but also the way they survived supremacy, right? Like just having a, a breathing practice, um, and a movement practice. And then finally, yeah, I just spend, you know, my free time DJing and, and listening to different forms of music to, to keep my, my ear, you know, um, engaged. As you know, I'm turning 40 in two days. I mean, I'm so damn, yeah, excited about that. Right. But then also, I'm thinking about this idea of what is the next 10 years going to be like? And what is this, the, the decade of legacy that you're building, legacy and purpose, right? That's kind of the conversation that I'm having in my head with myself. And then here you are in Amsterdam um, writing your book, documenting mm -hmm. our history, documenting stories. But then also I was thinking about James Baldwin and all the work you've done in researching about his life and kind of the trajectory you you're taking and the trajectory that he took, which is kind of parallel if you put the two next to each other. And then I really liked your post uh, about Basquiat uh, that I found very insightful. So I just wanted to talk to you about, as you're here in Amsterdam, coming from the States, being the, the state that the United States is in right now, what is this experience like for you? before I stepped in front of this camera. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, of course, I'm, I'm always thinking about and, and revisiting Baldwin's work. But literally minutes ago, I was just reading two very important essays from Baldwin. Um, one is called Stranger in the Village. And this is an essay that he writes from Switzerland. Um, and he goes there and kind of talks about what it felt like to be the only Black American in this hyper-white place. 
even white with snow, right? <laughs> like it was like white across the board. Um, the landscape, the people, and he talked about, you know, how the children would respond, how there was fear, but also curiosity and intrigue. Um, the one thing that stood to me is that he traveled with his personal records and a record player. And one of the forms of music that helped him ground there was blues, right? Mm -hmm. Blues, Bessie Smith in particular, he was a huge fan of, um, of Ray Charles and, and, um, Aretha Franklin, Dinah Washington, and so many other people, but it was the music that helped him ground in this foreign place. And then the blues that kind of helped him navigate what it means to be Black American, to be witnessing what's happening in the States from afar, right? So that's what I'm doing now. Um, I'm listening to a lot of blues music. I traveled here with my DJ equipment, like Baldwin's record player. I'm writing a book about a blues woman by the name of Willie Mae Thornton. So those parallels are inspiring. And I actually just found a quote that I want, that I want to use in the book, um, where he just talks about, there's a second article from the book, No Name in the Street, um, where he is documenting his observations of how Algerians are treated, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of challenging, um, Black American narratives around France is this hyper progressive country, right? And he talks about what he witnesses, how the Algerians are treated and jilled and harassed, um, and how, yes, he experiences some distance from American racism. He is still aware of, you know, um, France as a colonial force. So he is what. Alice Walker would call um, an ancestor in my line of work, which I talk about a lot, right? It's not just that I am, you know, a fan of Baldwin. It is that I am learning these lessons about how to move responsibly in other places, um, how to think about my own positionality, my own privileges um, as a Black American with a pass, a U.S. passport that has tons of, you know, mobility. Um, so he kind of models for me what it means to um, land in a place and commit to learning as much as I can about what black folks in particular are up against, but also or are creating around and, and creating with, right? So it's been amazing to be surrounded by artists um, such as yourself, um, the Kip Republic, but also Simone, um, just a number of scholars and cultural workers here in Amsterdam that we um, have sort of committed to be in community with to, to oh. develop our <laughs> practices. Who should I do? Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> oh, buddy. Jonathan, your mic is off. <laughs> Wait, you can't hear me? Oh, now I can. Okay, great. Awesome. <laughs> Welcome to the conversation. <laughs> Y'all so black. <laughs> There's a Harlem shaking happening. But Happy um birthday, oh. Jonathan. Thank you. Well, Thank Jonathan you. meet Lene. Lene meet Jonathan. Am I too early? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go. Bye. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, I'll call you. <laughs> well, that's Jonathan no, Corey. Hey! That was hilarious. <laughs> so um Legacy, I love to talk about legacy as an artist, as a DJ, I guess as a writer, and, and you creating cultural products in the form of plays and stuff. Like, we, we literally have things that um, other people will be sort of finding and discovering in somebody's archive, right? Whether it's books, um, like I said, like, you know, thinking about your work as a playwright and thinking about going to Harlem, to the Schumburg, across the street from where James Bowen was born, and finding Lorraine Hansberry's notes on, you know, Raisin in the Sun. So we're creating the work that other folks will be able to, to explore. Yeah, yeah, and the, the importance of having that archive, specifically here in the Netherlands, uh, we're having this conversation now about um, who came before us, but what has actually been documented. And there mm -hmm. actually hasn't been that much documented. I re remember when I was going to the theater school 20 some years ago here in Amsterdam, there wasn't a book on Rufus Collins. There wasn't a book on how Made in the Shade started. There wasn't a book on 
name it, anything, anybody here in the Netherlands, who were, who the people were that actually came before us. I remember the only book we had was Mr. Charlie from James Baldwin. And I remember when I moved to New York thinking, being so ashamed that I didn't even know who August Wilson was. So I had to learn that. So now we're in the Netherlands, we're having these conversations about how are we documenting? So also how are we leaving behind our legacy? So mm -hmm. I think the work that you're creating is so important. And um, I'm so grateful that um, for the relationship and connection we have as friends, as family, but also as artists, um, because we need that uh, specifically in these times where we're so challenged, our bodies are so challenged as women, as queer women. Um, and then also, like you say, being in the Netherlands, in the words of James Baldwin, where it's uh, as white as snow, um, how do you navigate through those spaces? <laughs> but um, just looking back at a year of COVID, Yeah, this last year of COVID um, and kind of adjusting to this new life has been interesting because on the one hand, yes, it's isolating and alienating and, and we miss each other and miss being in community, but we have sort of migrated our communities into these digital spaces. So um, during COVID, I have been able to kind of um, you know, be listening to panel discussions of things happening in Canada, you know, of scholars who are in other parts of the world um, thinking about COVID and, and creating work around COVID and especially the work of DJs. I feel like DJs um, stepped in to kind of create a global dance floor and to match this grief with music, right? right? So I think the role of the DJ has been highlighted in a very different way. And uh, the DJs and musicians and scholars and thinkers and writers have been activated um, during this time to, I mean, I haven't traveled a lot, but it was interesting to travel from the States to Amsterdam and to recognize the fact that I could be, you know, um, contributing to, you know, the, 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 the status of another country, right? So having to be responsible around that, um, and having to, once I got here, you know, uh, making sure that I sat still and just kind of um, observed um, and, and follow the, you know, the guidelines that are set here in place, but also thinking about, yeah, these vaccinations and, and how um, they will determine what the rest of, you know, the year will look like. Right. Um, but just learning also the role of race in COVID. Um, and, and, and thinking about and just wanting to acknowledge the fact that the majority of people who died were, were poor and black. Um, and so those are things that I've been holding and taking into my work as well. Mm. I really appreciate your work and you being here and inspiring us and leaving behind your legacy. Thank you so much and yours as well. Yours as well. I love that you are interviewing me from a place where you actually have a legacy, right? Your play. So thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing.